Healing comes to our life when we are truly desperate for God. Inspired poetry and the tiny littlest artifact that makes all the difference. From our broadcast center at BibleDiscoveryTV.com, it's Quick Study. Stay there as we continue. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. From our broadcast center at BibleDiscoveryTV.com, this is Quick Study Bible Discovery TV, taking you through the Bible in one year. Welcome to all our radio viewers as well. Now listen, today we're going to be studying and reading, here's our reading assignment, Psalm 43, 44, and 45, Psalm 49, Psalm 84 to 85, and Psalm 87. Now believe me, they're short psalms, so don't get worried. But today we're going to focus specifically on Psalm 84, 1 to 12. We learn that healing comes when we are desperate for God as we go through the Bible chronologically. Now Corey is here with Bible Discovery Archaeology. Corey, what's up? When people tried to discredit the account of King David recorded in the Bible, a very tiny artifact turned the tide. Uh oh, I, there's, there, there it goes again, those tiny little artifacts. <laughs> All right, so what's up for Do You Know? Well, do you know what the psalmist would rather be in the house of God than dwell in the tents of wickedness? All right, very good. Uh, excellent, and we'll talk about that and more. Here is Corey with Bible Archaeology and those, those uh, pesky little discoveries. Here we go. capital city of the nation of Israel under King David's leadership is the city of Jerusalem. And the Bible says that David's kingdom was very well established. We see that from the context of the scripture. Right now, you and I are going to take a look at the early history of Jerusalem. Recently, a tiny piece of an ancient tablet was discovered in an excavation in Jerusalem. It preserves Akkadian writing that has been dated to around 1400 BC, making it by far the earliest writing to have been found in Jerusalem. Due to the small size of the broken clay document, it's impossible to piece together what it said. However, it is clear that it was of top scribal quality, and it has been noted how intriguingly similar it is to the famed Amarna letters. The Amarna letters refer to clay tablets that were a part of Pharaoh Akhenaten's records, dated to around 1400 BC. They were written by kings of surrounding cities and nations. A prominent figure in the Amarna letters is Abdi Haba king of pagan Jerusalem, who is credited with writing six or seven of the discovered letters, and is mentioned by name in at least one other. The letters from this king of Jerusalem have been specially noted by researchers to be of a particularly high scribal quality, and they also portray a picture of a thriving, industrious, well-established Jerusalem smack dab in the middle of the time period of the judges. Biblically, this works. We're told that the people couldn't oust the Jebusites from Jerusalem. And King David gained special renown in the Bible for his conquering of this city, which he then chooses as his capital. The problem has arisen, however, that there has been almost nothing found archaeologically of this Amarna period city. Without the Amarna letters from Egypt, the Bible would stand alone in its description of Jerusalem before David. 
That is, until now. If this small clay fragment is what it seems to be, then it too proclaims, albeit quietly, that Jerusalem was indeed once a capable administrative center with a happening scribe. When it comes to the Amarna fragment, fragment found in Jerusalem, it's another case of you can't build whole arguments, whole historic arguments, based off of a lack of evidence when an area hasn't been fully excavated. It's very difficult to excavate in Jerusalem because it's inhabited by more people than it ever has in history before it. Now, excavations are continuously happening, but it makes it more difficult when someone's living on top of your excavation site. Uh, but when it comes to King David, this, this really shows that he did occupy a city that was very very well established economically, socially, politically, uh, that had a lot of international ties. So David really was a force to be reckoned with. This wasn't just some tribal village that he decided to take over one day. Now, Corey, you and I were talking about this the other day. It really is remarkable. I mean, when you think about the Moabite stone, uh, which people walked over for years as a piece of a sidewalk, and you think about the Dead Sea Scrolls, which originally were cut up and sold for material in a shoe, I mean, it's like this, this uh, people don't notice it's this archaeology is just coming to light. It's, it's really happening right now in these days, isn't it? It really is. And I mean, it's something that uh, we can't take for granted because in our society, we live in Canada. It's really quite young. But when history is all around you, it's easy to take for granted. I'm telling you, uh, God, is, uh, God is on the move and we're discovering things. And I want to introduce you quickly to let you know about Revelation chapter 1, a series we're doing on Revelation. And this is the first DVD. You can get a hold of it. We're offering it this month. It's called Revelation, Looking into the Face of God, a teaching video I did. We're going to do a teaching video on every chapter of Revelation. If you would like yours DVD video teaching series on Revelation, it's P.O. Box 150. Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 156680150 for a gift of $25 or more to help us out here at the ministry, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. Quickly, the phone numbers to reserve yours today, 724-733-8336 in the United States of America. In the great nation of Canada, 519-940-8338. Superheroes of the faith know that the presence of God changes everything. When the good King David was building ancient Israel, he knew the power of God's presence. And while repairing the horrible breach that King Saul had ripped into the fabric of God's people, David wrote many psalms about the healing presence of God. Psalm 84 is one of them. Composed probably about 1020 BC, this healing music reshaped the ancient nation. God's anointing for David was far beyond kingship. It extended to national healing and restoration of God's purpose for ancient Israel. Psalm 84, verses 1 through 12. How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. O God, behold our shield and look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. 
I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. Psalm 84, verses 1 through 12. Thank you for joining us. Rod Hembry here as we continue to study uh, the environment of King David in the ancient times. We are talking about 1000 BC, about 3000 years ago, if you can imagine. And what we learn today is a lot about the presence of God. And we learn today that we can learn a lot from the past to help us today where we are with what we have. So let's take a look at the overview because I want to present this to you. Get out your power guides and study along with us. We're going to cover three of the four points. All four points are in your power guide. I call this strong presence, and I'm talking about the presence of God. Now our reading assignment in the quick study power guide is Psalm 43 to 45, Psalm 49, Psalm 84 to 85, and Psalm 87. We are specifically today going to focus on Psalm 84 verses 1 to 12, and uh, we're going to try to get to all of those verses, but we may not get to all of them. But here's the point. When King Saul finally committed suicide and, and killed himself because he had rejected God and spent a life of rebellion, chasing David and doing all the wrong things and abusing his power. David takes over the country. But I need to tell you something, the country's in a mess. Ancient Israel is left bleeding uh, from leadership right on down. And so David inherits a mess, and he has a great job of healing. You see, the anointing of David was not simply to be king, it was also to be healer. And that's why he, God drew a shepherd boy who knew how to put the oil on the sheep's head when the sheep would come to him bleeding and bruised. And so much of David's work as a king is going to be healing the nation of Israel. And the Psalms that we study today were written during the time that David first was in that process of healing Israel from Hebron. And so, beloved, let's take a look at the first scripture and learn about the healing presence of God and apply it to today. Here is the scripture. So Psalm chapter 84, verses 1 to 2 say this, and I love this Psalm. It's one of my favorites. How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh literally cry out for the living God. What an amazing thing. I want to go straight to the point. Here's the point. Healing comes when we are so desperate for God that even our flesh longs for him. Now, I want you to think about this because David, in inheriting this broken kingdom, realizes that there is going to need to be a great deal of healing. I mean, the kingdom is a mess. The country is a mess. Now, beloved, may I say to you today that whenever we see a nation, a family, whenever we see a city or a state or a province in a mess, the way I like to look at it is the, the pride is gone and the humility is there and the desperation for God is there and there is great opportunity for healing. And so when we see that healing comes when we're desperate, are we in desperate times right now? Well, this is an opportunity for us to do something about it and to change the state that we're in. David knew when he went in as king, the nation of Israel was in a desperately broken position. And so he begins to write these psalms. Let's go on to the next passage. Even the sparrow, David says, has found a home. That is the most amazing symbol of humility. There is nothing any smaller uh, in terms of importance in the bird and animal kingdom than a sparrow. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her eggs or young and even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house for they will still be praising you Sila. Now that Sila means a time of rest and meditation on what has just been said. This is amazing to me because when you see that there is no person 
that God will refuse if they are in a humble state. That is the position. And David even uses nature here to explain that humility is the best position to be in before God. Very, very interesting. Blessed are the poor in spirit, Jesus would say, for theirs is the kingdom of God. This is an amazing truth preached to us from Psalm 84. Holiness to us and holiness to God is very different. God makes us holy by his altar. We are often, or we often try to be holy by our works. Now, beloved, may I say to you today that it's so important for us to realize we think we have to be all perfect to come in the presence of God. And God says, come to me as you are in your humility, in your poorness of spirit, and I, my presence will heal you. Well, the scripture goes on to tell us more. The Psalm verses five and seven of 84 says, blessed is the man whose strength is in you, O Lord, whose heart is set on a pilgrimage. That pilgrimage would be to go to the house of God. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring, the valley of Desertin, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools and they go from what? Strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion in Israel, a prophetic scripture, but I'm going to focus on the application. And here is the application. The presence of God in us builds the kingdom of God around us as we go from one season of life to another, or it could be said from one situation to another. Beloved, we need to remember that we need not be all successful and proud and wear billion dollar suits and drive fine cars to impress people with the power of God. I can tell you how we impress people with the power of God when we realize that we are not a distinguisher of persons and we treat the person that has nothing the same as we treat the person who has a lot. When we become people who are willing to see every soul as equal, when we become people who are willing not to build up our pride to try to present God as ambassador, but we come in humility, understanding we are sinners saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. This is the disposition of an ambassador of Christ, and we learn it from the Psalms. Today, the desert oasis of En Gedi is a popular hiking spot for tourists and locals alike. But its ancient history is very diverse. It was not just a hiking place that was beautiful. It was also very productive and practical. The name En Gedi means spring of the goat and is the name of Israel's largest oasis. Located on the western shore of the Dead Sea, this oasis has four perennial springs and so has always been prime territory for cultivation and the home of much wildlife. Located along cliff faces, En Gedi is also home to thousands of visible and hidden caves, many of which are still being explored and likely house ancient treasures. The first mention of En Gedi in the Bible is found in the book of Joshua, where En Gedi is listed as in the territory of Judah. Excavations at En Gedi, however, have revealed an older than Judah temple on a cliff overlooking the Dead Sea. Its use is a mystery because of the lack of any written history. The temple was not destroyed, but rather abandoned, possibly due to invasion or threat bronze ceremonial artifacts dating to the biblical time period just after the flood of Noah, the time the temple was in use, were found in a cave a few miles away, articulating the very early advancement in metallurgy. En Gedi was also the famous hideout of King David as he was being hunted by Saul, a place of lush vegetation, plenty of water, and a notoriously confusing system of thousands of caves to hide in. En Gedi was the perfect natural fortress. Perhaps one day, an unexplored cave high up in a cliff face will yield remnants of David's campgrounds. During the days of Solomon, the Bible refers to the vineyards at En Gedi, and many other historic documentation speak of fruit, perfume, and leather production. In the days of the Split Kingdom, the kings of Judah built up the city of En Gedi as a royal economic center, testified to by royal seal impressions. 
Between the 1st century BC and the 1st century AD, the city of En Gedi was caught up in the Great Jewish Revolt of 66 AD and the Second Jewish Revolt, leaving the city worse for the wear. Although it did enjoy a resurgence between the 2nd to 6th centuries AD, leaving behind now famous Jewish synagogues. This ministry is supported exclusively by our Discovery Partners. Discovery Partners are viewers who have joined us by giving a monthly offering in any amount. We have no other source of income except the regular giving of Discovery Partners. When you do give, we will automatically send you our Bible Power Guides every month. 32 pages of Bible commentary that match the daily programs. These guides also contain the unique reading plan of Quick Study. Join us today and become a part of the Bible Discovery Team. Now is the time to bring God's Word to our troubled world. Send to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2, or call 519-940-8338 in Canada, or 724-733-8336 in the USA. You can also support at www.biblediscoverytv.com. Thank you for staying with us. And it's good to have you as we continue to go through. You know, we're going through the Bible chronologically. Yes, we are. So that means that sometimes we're in First Chronicles, mm -hmm. sometimes we're in First and Second Samuel, mm -hmm. sometimes we're in the book of Psalms. I love how the Psalms are being inserted into uh, the accounts of what's happening. It's true. In fact, in, in a future day, a few days here, we're going to have an account of David uh, wanting to build the temple in Samuel. And then that same account in Chronicles. Mm -hmm. And they're just a little bit different. One highlights sort of a priestly point of view and the other highlights sort of a historical point of view. So it's very interesting. So we're learning about the Bible and uh, it's just fascinating. Next time on Quick Study, I want to mention to you, we're going to be in First Chronicles 3 to 5. It's going to be a good one. Listen, when marriage is not sacred, family goes wrong and becomes very troubled. One of the things we've lost today is the sacredness of marriage. That concerns me. Mm -hmm. In fact, one in 10 marriages will, will fail. Uh, we know that by uh, the 30th anniversary, there's a 41% chance that marriage will fail. That's because we've lost the sacredness of marriage. It is a sacred covenant under God. And we'll talk about that on the next program. Do you know? Yes. Do you know what the psalmist would rather be in the house of God? and dwell in the tents of wickedness. I love this psalm. This is a great psalm. Corey, what do you think? I think I know this one. <laughs> I think the answer is a doorkeeper. You're right. And we're going to read the full verse 10 of Psalm 84. And here's what it says. For a day in your courts, O God, is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Yeah, but think about that a minute. If you were a doorkeeper in the house of God, you'd be in the presence of God all the time. All the time. That's pretty intense. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. I could say a lot about the millennium, but I'm not going to get to that because I'll ruin <laughs> it for later on in the year. Quickly, I just wanted to let you know that we're on Twitter. You can follow us and find out the latest. Corey teaches at Bible Discovery Seminary. Uh, archaeology courses for you. Ryan teaches there for you. Theological courses for you. Uh, the seminary and the college. And you can follow us on Twitter. My, uh, my little identifier there is at Rod underscore TV. Make sure you follow us. Again, I need your help. If we're going to stay here every day, if we're going to be here on the internet, if we're going to be on this radio station and you're listening to us, then we need your participation. When you write and become a regular partner, uh, we want to send you the Power Guide. Now, our special offer is, of course, the Revelation DVD for $25 or more. But if you're not a regular monthly discovery giver, I encourage you to pray about it and ask God what He would have you do. You can give in any amount. We'll make sure that we send that 32-page, 12,000-word exclusive commentary, My Heart to Yours Pocket Guide, uh, Power Guide to you every single month. Here's the address, P.O. Box 
1-850-150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. And in Canada, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. You can also call 724-733-8336 in the United States and 519-940-8338 in Canada. Also, just a quick reminder before we move on to the call to prayer, look for us on the Roku box in the channel store. Search Bible Discovery TV free and we'll be there. The key to changing the world around us is to take time in God's presence, which changes the heart in us. Prayer and meditation upon the scriptures is never, ever a waste of time if we learn to listen to God. The present world creates a culture with a lot of moving parts and many distractions. Time is often wasted on meaningless activities that frequently cause us to lose even more and more time. But there is great strength for life when we learn that God is important. In fact, God is all important, even more than Facebook and Twitter. With that, we pray, Lord, teach me to spend real and right time with the things in my life and the Word of God. Help me to build in my life devotion to you. In our Strength in Your Mind segment today, great question, where in the Bible does the words of God compare to choice silver purified in the furnace seven times? Some of you will know that. It actually says the word of God is pure and perfect. Uh, tried in the furnace seven times like silver. Very interesting. I want to say hello to everyone watching on Watchman Broadcasting in Augusta, Georgia, and all across the world on the Roku box on that channel, and Dorothy Spaulding and the good people there, Russell. We want to say hello to everybody watching there and encourage you to come to Jesus. You see, the Bible says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, God says, and anyone who lets me in, I will come in and have fellowship with him. So all you great people in the state of Georgia, we love you, and we want to encourage you to come to Jesus. We want you who are watching Watchmen Broadcasting to confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. Say, Lord, I believe you died on the cross and rose again, and today I take you as my Lord. Come to Jesus and get in contact with Watchmen. On behalf of them and all of us here at Quick Study, come to Jesus today. He's waiting for you. Your personal power guide is waiting for you in our offices. Write today with an offering in any amount and we'd be happy to send it to you. Or you can call at 519-940-8338 or 724-733-8336.